You're listening to Honey, We Made a Disney Podcast. Two friends since first grade, now dads reliving the Disney movies we grew up on with our own kids. I'm Eddie Ferguson. And I'm J.B. Wagner. And on today's episode, we pour the wine and cut the cheese as we review The Hunchback of Notre Dame. But first, Eddie, how are the kids? How's the family? We are doing wonderful. We are uh, in full summer mode, enjoying the blistering humidity that is Indiana, mm-hmm. which isn't that mm-hmm. bad compared to others, let's be honest. But um, Yeah, compared to Atlanta, it's not too bad. Mm, true. Um, and enjoying lots of what Lewis calls fire truck candy. Do you guys have fire truck candy? Fire truck candy? No. Yes. What is fire, fire truck, truck candy? Fire truck candy is what you received from the fire trucks during the 4th of July July parade, parade, which I found out is not a thing everybody does because I was talking to somebody a couple weeks ago about, hey, we got to find a 4th of July parade to go to. And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, 4th of July parade. Like, don't you guys have parades on 4th of July? They're like, no, we don't. We have Christmas parades. Didn't know that was a thing. Did not know that was a thing. Sorry to bust your bubble right there. People don't have Fourth of July parades. People like, don't what have, do you do for Fourth of July? You just blow stuff up and barbecue. So, just for some context, if you're listening and you're like, "Well, what Fourth of July parade? I've never heard of this," which is be really odd. Yeah. I mean, the town we grew up in does a typically like a hour and a half two hour parade yep this year we're still a little kind of post COVID or whatever it was a hair over an hour long parade (laughs) like but still and we sit right at the front of the parade so we get tons of candy fire truck candy ton and lewis calls it fire truck candy oh that's fun because his favorite moment is when all the fire trucks go by and they throw out candy from there as ever as every little boy his favorite yes But do you know, in our family, our opinion, who gives out the best candy in the Brownsburg Parade? Who? Your uncle. Oh, M&M, M&M Body Shop. He gives out whole bags of regular and peanut M&Ms. And my mother, in particular, will sit at the parade, just real docile, loving, you know, taking pictures of the kid or whatever. Here comes Eminem Body Shop. She is like body checking kids to the side. <laughs> or she's this year she had a new strategy where she's like, hey, get me that. Get me that. No. You know, and she's barking at all the kids. All the kids, to like go all the and, grandbabies to go and get And having all the stuff. grandkids go out and get. Um, That's smart. Good job, Nancy. And then Sarah and I do this where we host Fourth of July because we live just right off the parade route. Yeah. So everybody comes to our house. And then uh, as a part of celebrating our glorious country, uh, we charge a candy tax on all the kids when they come back into Uh, the house. So Sarah and I stand at the door and all the kids have to open their bags and we we tax tax. our favorite candy that we want out of each other. Tax the kids to pay the pastor? Tax the kid to pay the pastor? Gotcha. No, I don't think that's good. But uh, so and we usually take most of the uh, whole bags of M&M's. Not going to lie. We're like, mm-hmm, yep. You're so mean. So, you're such your mean Uncle Eddie on Fourth of July. No, I'm teaching them a crucial part Basic of economics. what it means to live in America. You're doing your you part. Tax, you're you doing gotta, your part. You're going to learn what it looks like to, um, you know, and the older kids, we take more candy from them, you know, so we demonstrate the progressive tax, um, you know, the the. The, the wealthier have to pay their fair share. Progressive tax. I, okay. Okay. They are getting all kinds of, is this Keynesian Deep economics? Lesson. Is, is this, this uh, is a um, Smith? civics economics? <sighs> yes. Yeah. So, anywho, wow. fire truck candy. We've been eating lots of fire truck candy uh, here in the Ferguson household. Oh, goodness, Eddie. That, that is great. I, I, I feel for your for the kids. I'm, but I'm very glad that you had a Fourth of July parade. We did not. We just had the fireworks and just explosions and stuff like that. But uh, I walked by. Yeah, no, our neighbors do a big deal. I I looked at a 
trash heap at the end of one of the guy's driveway. And it was, I counted the boxes. It was, it was over $3,000 worth of fire truck. Wow. Just fi- fire truck. Fireworks just sitting at the end of his driveway. All burnt up. Money up in flames. And you know what I thought? Hmm. How many trips to Disney can I get out of that? I would much rather do a Disney trip than that. One mega trip. You could have done a mega stay at an How actual, we do it. Oh, yeah. How you, guys, like, how you guys do it. You could have gotten several trips. But how my wife wants to do her first uh, Disney World trip. <laughs> we get we get we, we get pretty close to one. And maybe. Staying, at, staying, staying at maybe 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 uh, she wants the Grand Floridian. Yeah, she wants the, the Grand Florida. Night. Yeah, I don't know. If, and that's probably not going to happen. That might be like we go visit that. We don't actually stay there but speaking of <laughs> but speaking of disney since we we're on there is there any disney news for us to talk about we forgot to to list something on here did you have any off the top of your head as we are vamping right now to try and fill the space <laughs> off the top of my we are head. we are coming up upon uh the end of loki series um we've got one more episode to go Um, We're going to hopefully be talking about that next time. We're going to see, uh, trying to get that in before Eddie leaves us for for a quick, quick little trip. But um, Loki, are you anticipating good things for this last one? Where's your temperature at right now? Uh, Thinking about this last episode this week. I feel like Loki has like each episode like exponentially grown. Grown how? Does that make sense? Grown worse, grown better, grown bad, grown fun. Grown better, like in my excitement and anticipation. You, you, are, you are getting close to 10, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And I like that the end of this this fifth episode, I was like, oh, this, what is, what's going on? It, it, I liked it a lot. Not gonna lie, it's been all over the place for me, uh, but similar to a lot of the other show the other two big shows uh while the first three first several episodes leave me questioning my life choices somewhere around episode four or five i start coming around like okay maybe i'm going to get into this after all um maybe i kind of and now i'm fully invested in okay i really want to know what happened what's going to be happening how they're gonna get out of this little little issue they got going on here who's really running things um i'm very i'm very intrigued that's where i'm at now yeah. i'm i have no idea what's going to happen no idea how they're going to land this plane if they're going to officially kill off loki because i mean to some degree i don't know where how they kind of bring him back into the fold he's he's been a part of this for so long now um but at the same time it's weird to just keep him on for one more series. It's kind of weird. We'll see. We'll see. Like he could have gone out in a grand victory, not victory. He died tragically <laughs> on, yeah, on, I, the, on the, on the, on the, on the Asgardian on ship game. on, on, in, uh, well, no, on in, in infinity war. He died in infinity. Oh war. yeah, that's right. Yeah. I didn't like his death there. Like it felt so trivial. Or I'm like, no, you can't leave it there. Like, there's just no way. It set the tone, though, that this was this. There are huge this stakes. This is serious. This is yeah. stakes. They're gonna kill him off. Now it'll him. it'll be interesting to see how they end it, and I think and who's at the end of it. I think this will set up. Like these series are obviously setting up the next phase, which is very intriguing to me. They're being very specific um, about their decisions. Yeah. Um. Black Widow came out this past weekend. Yes. Um, which was Did you get a chance uh, to go see it? It was it's what set right after Civil War. Right after Civil War. She is on the lam. Okay. Trying to trying to stay safe. Because she I has have betrayed not seen it. Iron Man. You have not seen it. Ooh. I have not seen it. So we need to stay spoil free here. One word I Eddie. have not seen it. The Guardian. <laughs> There's <It's> two words. <laughs> Eddie, I got two words for you. <laughs> Inside joke from high school. Um, uh, but did you see uh, Black Widow had like a huge weekend, not just on um, uh, in theaters. So it earned 
80 million in the domestic box office which that was is 10 similar. more that was 10 more than uh or six to 10 more than um fast and furious fast nine right then it had 78 million on uh, the international but this was the first time disney released that it made 60 million on premier access wait wait they made almost as much yes on premier access which every penny goes to them boom straight to them we are never getting theaters back again theaters are gone we will always have this mixture no it's going away if this is what they're doing i don't i don't think there will i don't think it's going away think about this though if they just can't it can't go away just think if it was only premier access they could have made more money sure. they sure. lost some of their revenue just for the theater yeah just for some people and they don't get nearly as much money uh now granted maybe you can say well you get a bunch of people together i know i know several people off the top of my head uh just as we were talking today at lunch who went together like with their in-laws or with their friends and they split it um, three ways, two ways or whatever. So $15, $30. So I, I guess maybe they're not completely losing money, but I think, I mean, I don't know how they can turn back. This is incredible numbers. Yeah. 60 million. It, it, and it's so one, they told us that it's 60 million. They haven't told us any of the other premier access earnings. Yeah. So that means I'm going to guess none of them have come close to this. So, I mean, you're probably looking at maybe the 30, 40 to range being the best on any of the previous premier access. I, I will Raya say or, yep. but, but this has probably been easily right. The biggest of their titles that they've dropped, like yes. first Marvel, um, Cruella may, you know, Mulan maybe could, but not at the same level as a Marvel tentpole Black Widow. This was also the first film in easily a year and a half that there's been a palpable and everybody coming to for us at the lunch table going, did you guys see did you see Black Widow from everybody? Like every mm-hmm. like normally we don't get that. Maybe you have to kind of ask around a little bit to see and find yeah, somebody who went and saw it. What? I'm talking almost everybody saw this film or has planned to see this film that's the draw that a and it's it's crazy because it's the draw like because we've been having other marvel products with these shows and stuff like that but this this an mcu mm-hmm. movie with scar with uh black widow it, it's the big it's the biggest biggest thing it really yeah. is yeah so it just so begs to say like they could have easily topped 100 120 million dollars or more had this been just theatrical that's interesting but that is it's we've got the mixture here to stay um because apparently warner brothers is seeing really great numbers as well with their dual launch same day they're doing I, i bet you they'll extend it yeah. If they're seeing anything close, like I don't we don't know what Fast Nine got, or I don't think we got know what Fast Nine got. If it got Fast Nine didn't. Uh it was on Peacock. Yeah. You you could pay right. for Sorry. a higher level yeah. for Peacock. That's right. Fast There's Nine. There's so many now. Wrong. I can't keep all of them straight. This is this is bad. I, I think we're getting kind of close to maxing out. And I we're gonna see even more of those mergers and things happening. Yeah. I think we just heard you about saw, we like, just heard the, another one. The, the, the Paramount Plus, kind of like everybody coming together, that was a really big one, just to kind of merge it all. Yeah. Well, even Warner Media is now going to be uh, HBO. HBO. I, I, Joe Max, I think we're going to see that come into Peacock or somehow the yeah. two of those are, or no, no, not my bad. They're, they're uh, just got bought up by um, Discovery. So we're going to see that kind of merge together with uh, Discovery Plus. Um, so we're already seeing some contraction a little bit, but anyways, yeah. it's crazy. Man, that's 16 that's million just on Premier Access. Which, <laughs> speaking of Premier Access, uh, you're getting ready to go to a Disney park this fall. 
they are um, they're testing it at the Paris Park right now, but there's going to be no longer any free fast passes. They're getting rid of the fast pass system, and they're create in Paris. They've created a new program called Premier Access, where you pay for Premier Access to select attractions at the park. So there are attractions you won't be able to go to or just the fast pass you won't be able to use. The unless- fast pass. There's no longer any fast pass. So everything's normal standby lines. But you pay a higher for, for you, you pay, pay extra a higher, for a ticket. You can get to the, you know, yeah, that was bound uh, to happen. A fast pass. That was that. bound to happen. They got to find new ways mm-hmm. to make, make money pay more. So it's OK. That just means we're probably going to have to pay for it. <laughs> Or just wait in line, which in many ways, fast passes slowed down both lines because they gave away too many fast passes. Yep. <clears throat> but but anyways, there you go. that's when you were like stall for for news that that was what I was trying to find. I was like, I knew I saw some big Black Widow news that is substantial. Well, then I will not give you any hints. We'll have to talk about that next time on the. the did next you go episode. and see it in theaters? Oh, yeah, I did. I love it was definitely worth going to see in theaters okay if you get unless you got a really kicking home theater system with 70 inches and crazy surround sound and no kids yeah. if you don't have that go see this in theaters because it's, it's a hoot we are seeing it this weekend okay. we are going on a little short weekend getaway and mm-hmm. so we and my sister is watching the kids, so we're like, yes, we baby get moon. a movie date night. Yes, third baby, baby moon. Third third baby moon. Yep. Going to a wedding at, that's out of town. We've kind of extended it a little bit. So we I'm trying to remember, I don't think we've even had one baby moon. We, we were going to have one before my son came, and then he came five weeks early. Yep. We were literally just about to go on it. And then with <laughs> my daughter, we I guess we did the trip to Indiana, saw, stayed with your family, just saw some people and stuff like that. Um, but we didn't necessarily have a just <clears throat> me and my wife trip. So maybe maybe we, we end up having three down the road. Eddie's crossing his fingers for our podcast listeners. But there's still some lively debate. But anyways, that's not why you're here. <laughs> for for this podcast you're here to as we are marching our way from 1985 not 1985 1988 all the way through 2005 as we go back and revisit all the disney movies we grew up on um now watching them again with our disney plus access and occasionally some of them we have to get off of uh target.com but anyways today's episode that we were talking about is the 1996 classic Hunchback of Notre Dame. Cue the Disney sound effect. Okay, IMDb description for Hunchback of Notre Dame is this. Hold on, hold on, hold on. hold on. I've got to jump in here and correct you. You're saying it wrong. It's the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Sorry, I put... I put... Please... Please remember I, I the article. I shortened it to fit on the page better. So I'm, <gasps> I'm sorry. So. I'm just I'm just being Henri. You're just being you. you never, never, <laughs> never change. Never change. The IMDb description for the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Thank like you. The Ohio State University. Anyways. A deformed bell ringer must assert his independence from a vicious government minister in order to help his friend, a gypsy dancer. Deformed you... is a little strong. Not that he's not deformed, but it's, it's, it's kind of mean. I'm sorry. You did that with a great Frollo voice. I, was, I, I, liked, I liked the performance. Ooh. He, this was a strong performance. I may have recently had to do some uh, voiceover work for a funny video at, uh, at the office. Um, what? I was comping in some VO for voice. That's the industry term for 
voiceover vo i uh we we industry need, term that's the industry term i'm shaking my head right now like i'm special uh i was just comping in some temporary stuff but i i channeled my inner uh brooklyn 99 um jake from brooklyn 99 where he when he pretends to be die hard um i use we, that voice for doing it and then somebody liked it and they were like let's just keep going with it so i was like okay let me just redo it but better yeah so we that's are we are rewatching our way through Brooklyn. Oh, Nine. it's so good, so good, so good. I need to see where we're at. But well, honestly, this total total ty- uh, side tangent here. We're actually watching through Lost. Me again, Sarah for the first time. Mm. But <clears throat> we can't go to bed straight off of a Lost episode. You got to watch something as a power <clears throat> so we watch Brooklyn Nine Nine. For uh, for me, I, I know I asked you, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and jump to it. This was definitely one that we watched a lot. We had this, I can remember the VHS, the worn edges of the box, the case. I can feel it mm. in my hands, the weight of it, the way it snapped together. This was definitely one that we owned and watched quite a bit. Um, I wouldn't say that this is one that we, I remember watching it frequently, but not like a ton. Yeah. Um, no, no, this wasn't definitely wasn't an everyday thing, but I yeah, remember watching this. Where I think maybe Beauty and the Beast a lot more frequently, yes. you know, Lion Queen, Lion King, Aladdin a lot more frequently. This one, um, the, the line that I remember so much as a kid is the one that I put in the intro. That's why I chose that line for the intro, because I just remember Jason Alexander's Hugo um you know pour the wine and cut the cheese Uh, for some reason i thought that was like the funniest line ever as a kid and i would repeat that line all the time it's funny because when i listen to it the the voices sound so iconic to that time period but there's only really two people that are like household names that are in this it's demi moore as esmeralda and Jason Alexander, um, and you are giving me then the then saying that there are three people that I should. Kevin have. Klein is in this, and I'm having trouble figuring out why what Kevin Klein did or what he, he was has Phoebus. Done. I know, but I'm looking and I I I I literally can't remember what he was in. Um. Well, he's an Academy Award winner. And three-time Tony Award winner. Four. Um, what did he win his... Um, I see A Fish Called Wanda. A Fish Dave, Called Wanda is what he got. French um, Kiss. This, this, these board. are not like prime... The big Chill. Pe- Dave. Did you ever see Dave? Dave is one no, of the funniest movies I, I don't ever. think I've seen any of this. The only thing I've seen is evidently he was on the front cover of, of uh, for Wild Wild West, which... To be honest, yeah, he was in thing. Wild Wild West with um with Will. But Smith. these none of these are like massive movies that you would you, um, would, you would you would. I mean, A Fish before. Called Wanda was pretty big, but I mean, of course, that was eighty eight, and we wouldn't have known that then. Uh, the Big Chill is a pretty 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 massive movie. French Kiss was big as well. Um, yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you that. It's just uh, not Jason the same Alexander. Thing as- I mean, he's, you know, uh, right at the beginning of, or right in the middle of his Seinfeld run, right? Yep, he's, so, at his, he does, he's in his apex, Jason Alexander, right here. And then so you got, that's really big. Can you get Demi, um, and Demi Moore is massive, too, so. Sure. Now, the guy who voices Quasimodo, Tom Hulse, he was just coming off of an award-nominated um, portrayal of Mozart in Amadeus. Well, there you go. Which... That was, well, not coming off of. That was 84, so a little bit differently. But yeah. I mean, he and he was a big Broadway star. Um, and then Tony J, who's the voice of Frollo, um, he had played, um, what was he? He was in uh, several other kind of Disney things as well. Um, yeah. So that's why I say you hear the voices and you go, oh, yeah, I totally remember these. But then trying to put a face to it was a little bit more difficult. Oh, he wasn't. He was Monjour DRK. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. In, uh, in Beauty and the Beast. Interesting. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I, I hear you. This is not, I don't think that this is the movie that um, maybe rested on some like powerhouse voice actors. Not quite that, the same as some, Lion, the, like the Lion King. Like the Lion King, Beauty and the Beast definitely really, really laid on that uh, pretty heavily. Um, I, I do have to say, Mary Wickus, um, the voice of what was the... Uh, Laverne, the third gargoyle. Yes. She's one of my favorite character actors just in like <laughs> random roles all throughout like yes. the 40s, 50s, 60s mm-hmm. onward. She's just just kind of got a classic style and voice and all of those different things. That was so, actually um, Mary This Wicks. was her last role. Oh, it was her last role? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. She's the, she's the housekeeper in um, White Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I remembered. Oh, and yep, Sister Act and Sister Act 2. Oh man. I take that all back, Eddie. Mary Wicks is in this. I completely she's forgot phenomenal. about her. Yeah. So awesome. Uh Eddie, let's talk about the music. How did you feel about the music in this? I I forgot. I I love the music in this. Um, come on, come on. And I I've heard I've like there's a couple of the songs that will like pop up in our Disney playlist. We love Disney, right? So we've got a Disney playlist that'll you know play with the kids and everything. And so there's a couple songs that pop up with all of this. But it'd been a long time since I had heard the bells of Notre Dame. Yep. And uh, when Sarah and I sat down to watch this and, you know, we kind of had it turned up here in the basement with our surround sound and to hear just the epic nature of that song, like it, it is, it's something like it just kind of rattles you uh, a bit. Um, I think this is a really... I was going to save this for later, but let's just go ahead and just dump, jump <laughs> straight in, right? Okay. Um, this is such a daring animated film. It is. Um, and in essence, I think what they, they took Beauty and the Beast, because it's the same um, director and producer, like core team from Beauty and the Beast went on and did yeah. Hunchback. And I, there's an element where they they got a, a best picture nomination for Beauty and the Beast, right? Where they th- it wasn't like best animated feature, like that didn't even best exist yet. Overall picture, yeah. Best picture. And I think that emboldened them to say animation isn't just a child's medium. Animation yeah. is a is a medium that can be used across multiple and this genres. is not a this is not a very childish story not in the slightest not at all a lot of d- deep dark themes of race class uh no I, and i want us to go there i think there the themes in this are so deep and moving but they in many ways they took the if um uh little mermaid and beauty and the beast was the first um, entrance into the fun Broadway musical. This was the first entry into the deep, serious Broadway musical. Yep. Um, and you, you've you got to draw the correlations to Les Miserables. Like, just that deep human condition being played out in song and in, 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 in theater. Um, this just has a depth to it that boom, right off the bat. And they, and they do a good job, right? Like they add in some fun, goofy songs. Yep. They have mm-hmm. the gargoyles for a little bit of comic relief. Which the, the, the gargoyles jester. go on to have their own animated series too. That's right. I, I watched a lot that. of that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, the music in this is, is amazing. It also sets that tone that this is a, this is a serious movie. This is not a lighthearted kids movie. This has some depth to it. Yeah, from uh-huh. the very first scene where he's about to drown a child, a baby. 
and it carries throughout the in, throughout the entire thing where they're they're basically torturing him on on the we on the wheel like uh after king of fools which is so heartbreaking that whole post like because it's such a big climactic moment for him and then it comes down so quickly so sharply uh it's intense yeah yeah i um yeah it you're not expecting a disney movie to like right off the bat like you're dealing with you know questions of infanticide of damnation of lust and pride and uh, racism, religiosity yeah. and racism like it just comes out heavy and swinging but also like not in um not in a trivial way like not in yeah. a um oh let's see how we can make this lighthearted cuz even the the moments where they're okay this is a kids kind of version of this it doesn't deter from those and then you get a song like hellfire that is terrifying even yep. as an adult i'm like this is terrifying but at the same time so good i would agree i would agree i had forgotten about most of the songs in this film they weren't like the first things i was thinking of uh although if, if any of them the king of fools is like the most lighthearted of a lot of a lot of this and probably why and it is so um catchy and stuff but even though i was watching this i was going you know what there's like outside of this there is like arena rock where it's like the songs that are worthy of being played in a giant stadium to the entire to a to a large large crowds it felt like every most of these songs were made to be experienced in a giant theater with a lot of people with a lot of reverb and a lot of um not the room every but a lot of the song had reverb in it like it's bouncing around inside of a bell tower um right. just felt that um again after rewatching this well it's funny how you make the comparison there um so they they tried to make this a uh, a broadway musical and pull out all of the G-rated content and make this like a full PG-13 story. Hmm. Um, and yeah, Disney Disney produced it, wrote it all out, um, but it just never made all the way to, um, to Broadway. They had three different out-of-town trials, the final one happening in 2015. Wow. Um, and the music to it is remarkable. If you ever get the chance, it's on, I'm pretty sure it's on Spotify, on Apple Music, where you can listen to the, you know, the the Broadway original cast, even though they pulled it right before they were they sent it out to Broadway. Um, and I'd love to know, like, why? Why didn't you just let this go? Because, um, and I had a friend who actually did a community theater production of it. And he was just sharing of like how he he felt like the Broadway version was on par in many ways musically with Les Mis. Hmm. Interesting. You but it, it, it has that gravitas where you feel like it it needs to be presented on a, a big stage. stage, a large yep. stage. Um, and yeah, you feel the reverb. I like how you said that. Like you can just sense the the grandeur of it. Reverberates off your soul, Eddie. Mm. Off your heart. Uh, you kind of mentioned it in some of like the the list of things of major themes, but that the the what is it? The love. It's not a love triangle. It's the love square happening here with uh, the hunchback and. Phoebus and um, Frollo, Frollo all kind yeah. of vying for uh, Esmeralda. It's it's kind of odd at times, kind of awkward a lot of the time. A lot of the time, you, and you feel bad for Quasimodo as he's he's uh, loves her too, and you're just like kind of sickened by every time Frollo is on the screen because he has these songs about it. 
there's there's a lot happening here in that yeah. like i'm just calling it a love square because i don't even know what else to what <laughs> else to call it the love square i like it the love square it um yeah like there is just a weird um yeah and i'm not familiar with victor hugo's original novel i've not read it um my, it's obvious that you know Disney took some license here and changed as a lot of different do. things as they always do. As they always do. Um, so my understanding is that there is um, that the novel does lay the ground for these darker, more serious themes okay. and and things to be to be played out. And the fact that they um, they embraced them, you know they. Again, this is not a kids animated movie. Um, this is I I don't I appreciate it so much more probably more than any of the other animated films we've looked at so hmm. far. I feel like I've appreciated this more now as an adult than I did as a kid. Where I think some of these that I've gone back and rewatched the animated films, I enjoy them at a similar level or, um, you know, maybe the same level, but just maybe from a different direction, you know, I enjoy the artistic level or whatever. This just kind of went to a depth that there was no way I picked up on as a kid. Oh, but yeah. I think now as an adult and, you know, particularly I think for me and what I do with my life, um, this just resonates on a, a whole nother level of, the tones of, um, you know, this is pre-Reformation Catholicism being presented here, um, and you those these themes of um, of religiosity yep. at a uh, just a hypocritical level that I think so many people do connect with and resonate of going, well, I don't want anything to do with religion because they're just a bunch of hypocrites who are judgmental, who um, have their own problems, but only point out the problems of others. Yep. Um, this is such a beautiful story that helps highlight of like, yeah, the the Bible actually agrees with you in that. Like Jesus came and chewed out the religious people, right? Like he couldn't stand the Frollos of the world yep. at, of his time. Jesus hung out with the gypsies. Like that's who he came to reach and, and who connected with Jesus. Um, and so I, I just find this incredible that Disney just makes such an open film that you see a loving God, a forgiving God, who the judgmental religious view loses and an accepting forgiving God is what um, uh, wins, like true good actually wins, not the evil that is um, masquerading as righteous. There's some parallels with uh, the, the sign above Jesus, the King of the Jews and with the whole, um, King of Fools and him being um, held down, tied down. There's and then having food thrown at him. There's a lot of parallels that I don't even know yeah. if they were fully aware as right. they were the, making this. the The Christ typology in this is is quite remarkable. Um, uh, the other moment that was really impactful for me is the song "God Help the Outcast." Ooh, yes, another another unsung, Whoa. unsung one. They're like, "Wow, that came out of nowhere." And and how she's walking through the cathedral, singing this, and then parallel, you've got all of these religious people praying mm -hmm. for wealth and yeah. praying for like, this and that. Now just saying we want to be famous when we're rich. <laughs> and that's crazy because it's um it that that's such a timeless theme. Mm -hmm. Um right it's the um even the the prayer from the gospels of you know the the um the poor widow coming um and uh, 
I'm getting I'm getting all mixed up here. No, it's you know the the prostitute coming and praying and being humble before the Lord, and then all the religious people going, "Well, I'm just so thankful that I'm not them." Yep. And G- and Jesus accepts the prayer of of the widow. Yep. Um, that song and and Esmeralda with all of the people in the in the cathedral praying for fame and wealth and everything is such a, a beautiful analogy again of the gospels being played out right there of going no this is this is the god of the bible like this is a forgiving loving god who i think so many people get lost in thinking that it's about material it's about wealth and the things that you want Blessing. and yeah, just give me the blessing. And then they walk around and they're judgmental and hypocritical of people that are different than them. Um, and the people look at that and go, well, I don't want anything to do with religion. I can't stand those people. Uh, and it's like, yeah, because that's that's actually not true religion. That's not really the relationship with a loving, forgiving God. And somehow Disney made a movie ex- explaining all of this, yep. like playing all of this out in front of us. Yep. That's why I say I don't think that they understood what they were really They couldn't doing. have, right? There's like, Because no I think if they did, they would have... They wouldn't have made it. They wouldn't have made it. They would have changed it. Especially not, especially when we're talking about movies made in 2021, there's there's a lot of that they, they would get rid of if they had any yeah, idea. Yeah, there's maybe they just wouldn't. no way. Well, now I, I, I feel really bad now that I watched this on my lunch break and didn't get the full effect. <laughs> Full effect that sitting at sitting at home like on the couch just being able to take it in without with all, all the distractions of people walking by and interruptions and stuff like that i feel feel sad that i didn't get the full effect like like you're describing here i did but i didn't get you know you know you, you like there's enough distractions where it's like i only sure. get about 65 percent of the full effect which probably means i shouldn't do that to actually review these things but then again we've made other liberties on this Show. It is um I I already know like Sarah wasn't able to finish it with me and then we're like we uh, we're going to go back and rewatch this uh together. Um like immediately I stopped and was like this is this is such a beautiful story and I somehow I remember the kind of funny, goofy moments as a kid. The guy um, getting free and going, I'm free, I'm free. Click. Dang it. Yeah. <laughs> that's the that's uh, the thing we quoted a lot as a kid. Um, somewhere out there, like that song kind of was always the big one that you hear played on Disney playlists and the ones that I remember. But here, like, here's another imagery that I, I actually wrote down on here that I saw. Uh, I, I put uh 10 pieces of silver, 20 pieces of silver, little on the nose with Judas and Jesus. Sell out, sell out um, your people. Right. right. Now, now, now I'm wondering if, no, they actually did, if there was just some, some person on the back and or like the writer of this was just like, I'm going to put this in there and the people that are paying my bills are going to have no idea what I'm doing, but somebody well, out there is going to get it. I mean, there's just too uh, many, there's too many parallels. Um, Victor Hugo, I mean, again, you can make the parallel to Les Miserables here because he wrote the novel for Les Miserables. So that's in no way a stretch for that. Um, and in that in particular, like the, the, the themes of grace and redemption are, are overt, right? So again, I've not read... Uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame. So I'm assuming the source material is so rich in the themes and in uh, imagery that if you're going to make a story about the Hunchback of Notre Dame, it's almost unavoidable. I would agree. Would would be my guess. Um, so yeah, Victor Hugo probably it's it's so so deep within the the story structure there's no way to get away with it but you're you've got to be right like the guy who well the screenplay in typical kind of animated um format there's like five people listed so i don't know i don't know who was the more predominant writer there we'd probably Um, just guess the source material had it all in it i'd be very interested to know if someone actually read the hunchback in Notre dame what (laughs) if if it's actually 
yeah holds up to what the animated is um one thing i thought about when uh watching this a little bit slightly off topic but uh, uh it's funny how many historical or real places or happenings or even novels and stuff like that that i only know based off of the cartoon or the kids movie or whatever the other one i thought and so this is one of them like no the no the, the hunchback of notre or the notre notre dame in general was not a part of my childhood until this movie came into it like i didn't sure. know anything i didn't know about any of that kind of stuff about the cathedrals or anything um then this movie came in and then all of a sudden everybody knew about no notre dame uh then you know about notre dame in uh northern indiana the school um I always it also made me uh, remember. Do you remember on PBS the show Wishbone, where the dog? Yeah, we would, were just talking about this. Yeah, it'd go back into into the in novels time. and stuff like that. That's how I know about a lot of basic uh, story plots or structures for some of the classic novels is because of Wishbone, and I think some of them are wrong, but uh, it gave me a a introduction to. A lot of those stories and um so that's what i was thinking about as i was thinking about notre dame i was like this is the reason that i know anything about notre dame yeah um what did you think th- uh this this film seemed to be more even cinematic yep like the cinematography Sweeping. some of the the shot structure like did you see this like there was sweeping, I mean, even sweeping the- angles and stuff like that The poster, like just go to Wikipedia and see the poster for this, where it's like looking down through some of the bells and just the angle where you see a bit of Paris, you see Quasimodo releasing a bird like, whoa, like just kind of the perspective there that the way that that is framed is, is again, just epic. Like it, you know that this is a story meant for a big venue, a big stage. That is super cool. You're talking about where he's sitting with kind of in the bell tower with the gargoyles. Is that what you're talking about? Or are you talking about the the other one with him and Esmeralda? Nah, I think this is n- neither. This is a, um, um, where he's on the, on the steeple. No, I just sent it to you so you can see exactly the one that I'm I'm talking about. Yeah, that's the one I was looking at. He's, oh, okay. Oh, hold up. They. That's funny. Uh, I think they reinserted on another poster that exact same thing, but they added the gargoyles. Oh, that's without the, the gargoyles, it it's not. A, I feel like this is the poster that makes it feel this is not a kids movie. This is a very serious uh, animated feature. So basically take that and add in the kids stuff. And that's kind of what uh, I'm trying to try to get it across to you now. This is some great, great audio where the people are hearing right now um, that I'm trying to send you over because it's literally the exact same thing. But there are gargoyles and it, and it's fun. Basically, it's like the other one was like, this is too. And you can see it once I send it to you. No, I mean, so the. The one that I'm, yeah, yeah. They make it look kind of silly and goofy, but the um, we'll definitely have to put on the the um, the show description both of these so that people can see the side by side. And and you've got to know, like, right, the marketing department from Disney when they first watched this movie, they had to have been like, "Are you kidding me?" What the crap? Like, how are we supposed to market this movie to families? Well, we know what they did. They were like gargoyles. Those. That's what we're gonna. That's what we're gonna put just, in all the trailers. I want to see gargoyles in everything. Just put them here. Put them there. Gargoyles. 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 Try and say that um, three times fast. Exactly. I just did. Gargoyles. Gargoyles. Uh, I can't. Gargoyles. I, gargoyles, I gargoyles. No, no, no. Um. No, but like, yeah, just seeing these two posters side to side of going, one is epic and sweeping. And you get a taste of the grandeur of the story. And then the others is like, wah, wah, you know, pop the wine and cut the cheese. Exactly. 
So exactly. Eddie, how are you going to rate this film? I I'm trying to I'm I I'm torn between like a 4.5 and a 5. There is no point 4.75. <laughs> there's only halves we've we've already we already been that's our structure is halves there's no halves or there's no no, halves. no there are halves so I, i'm on the fence there between the two where are you in trying you know convince me one way or the other i would say four because there are some moments in the story structure and stuff that kind of get little wonky the 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 love square kind of freaks me out a little bit yeah um so i'm definitely in but there's some really good stuff in this and i want to i i it's we talk i talk a lot about how what's the rewatchable factor of this and i already because you've sold me on wanting to go back right now and watch it again just to get the full effect of it yeah yeah, and, and I, I talk about the themes and uh, the story structure, the music. Um, I think some of that is just innate in the story that is being told. Uh, I, I'm going to give a lot of credit to the source material. Um, there's definitely some slow points. There's definitely some moments where I felt like the animation was a little like, come on, Um so I, I I'm gonna stick with my four point five. Okay, four point yeah. five it is. Well, that it that is it for this episode of uh, Honey. We made a Disney podcast. Next week we are going to be covering another amazing classic <laughs> called. We keep on doing this. We get we get a really big one, and then we go we go equally Boom. as bad. Uh, it's uh, First Kid. Featuring Sinbad. We we haven't we haven't we can't leave the nineties without doing a Sinbad movie. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Um I've never seen this film, so I'm very interested to see I'm not inter- I'm like I'm I am curious to see what actually happened in this film. This if I, so I remember a little bit seeing this, and if memory serves me uh, correctly, it's in the vein of like a blank check. It's, it looks like it. It's got that. Yeah. It's got that curious look of uh-huh. just like this kid is a, is gonna uh-huh. do something because he's got the power, can do whatever he wants to, gonna get into some trouble, maybe have a weird romance with an older lady. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, that was so weird. Oh, so weird. Still ah. so weird. But that the waterfall, the water spouts. Oh, so weird. Anyways. uh so that is it for the, uh, this episode. Please uh, subscribe. Leave us a leave us a rating wherever you listen to podcasts at. You can also go to honeywemade.com slash movies, and you can see the full list of movies that we got coming up. Uh, next week, we are pretty confident we might have um, a Loki one. I think we're. I think at some point we need to do a Loki retro on that series. We've made that our thing now is we take a week off to be able to uh recap a disney uh plus uh series so i think we're as, gonna do that again as you like to say it's our podcast we can do whatever it's our we podcast, want we do what we want we do what we want we, we make the rules but anyways that is it thanks for listening <laughs>